What does the Academy of Music, Tuskegee, Oscar Wilde, and Adolf Mensa have in common? My, 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 my. Another episode of The Gilded Age. Hey everyone, this is D Movie Man, fellow cinephile, popcorn addict, and emerging film critic, coming to you with reliable recaps, reviews, and reactions. And today, of course, I'm coming to you all with another episode of The Gilded Age, Season 2, Episode 3, Head to Head. This episode was directed by Michael Engler. This episode was co-written by Sonia Warfield, who was a producer and writer and is currently an executive producer for this series. She's previously co-produced the series Zoe Ever After. She's also written for the series Will and Grace, The Game, and She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, among others. This episode was also co-written by Julian Fellows. So we open up this episode seeing Bertha hosting a tea at her home, which of course concerns the Metropolitan Opera. Naturally, she is less than enthused to be hosting Mrs. Winterton, who we, of course, know very well as Turner, her former ladies' maid. However, as Mr. Winterton will likely be leading other patrons from the old guard to the Metropolitan Opera, she has little recourse. And we see the new Mrs. Winterton arriving for the tea, much to the shock and chagrin of the household staff. Bertha then presents her proposal for the Metropolitan and mentions that their new season will be starting October 22nd. Sounds simple enough. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I neglected to mention that October 22nd will also be the start of the Academy of Music's opening season. So here it is. The two opera houses will officially be going head to head and one will be declared the winner. Meanwhile, just across the street, we see Marion, Ada, and Agnes, and Aurora meeting with Mrs. Astor in support of the Academy of Music. Peggy is also there to take minutes for the meeting. We also see Mr. McAllister being forced to awkwardly and clumsily make his way from Bertha's home over to Agnes's to give Mrs. Astor and the ladies intel on Bertha's plans. But Mrs. Astor is undeterred. She then asks Agnes if she will take the liberty of informing the older members that if any of them are considering taking a box in the new Metropolitan, then their current box at the Academy will be swiftly removed. But of course, this will be simply presented as a mere rumor. Back at the Russell household, Bertha finally comes into contact with Mrs. Winterton while chatting with Mrs. Fish. And as I did mention at the end of the last recap, it does appear that Mrs. Winterton's current social standing far outranks Bertha's at the present moment, especially considering their wedding journey through England courting the aristocracy. Naturally, Mrs. Winterton does not hesitate to throw this fact in Bertha's face, but Bertha also has no problem reciprocating, hinting at Mrs. Winterton's former status. Mrs. Winterton does warn Bertha that any trouble that is made for her will be reciprocated. And what's more, she would like Bertha to ask her husband the real reason behind her being sacked. Oh, and here it is. I knew that this was going to come back to bite George in his hind parts, but here we are. And it doesn't make it any less frustrating to see. I have a feeling that this may be the first of a few L's that George is gonna take this season. Over at the New York Globe, Mr. Fortune mentions to Peggy how he has been invited to witness Booker T. Washington's opening of a new dormitory at the Tuskegee State Normal School. Although they seem to disagree about the impact of this new development, especially as it pertains to the advancement of the black race, Peggy realizes that stories like this are exactly why she became a journalist in the first place. Although Mr. Fortune seems to be ill at ease with the two of them traveling together, Peggy's enthusiasm seems to be slowly but surely winning him over. 
We also see that the affair between Larry and Mrs. Blaine is moving full steam ahead. A choo choo. Sadly, a much less pleasant affair is about to be discovered. Bertha finally confronts George about the secret he's been keeping from her all this time, and she reacts about as well as you might think, which is not at all. And as I had already guessed, it was pretty obvious, her issue is not with the fact that Turner tried to seduce George, but the fact that George knew about this didn't tell Bertha, and then allowed the very same woman who tried to seduce her husband, dress her, do her hair, and basically be paid and employed by her after that. Oh, hell no. I totally get where Bertha is coming from because it's just like, number one, there's the trust that's been broken. Because once trust is broken, how do you get that back? But then, you know, everything she's already said is just like, and now this woman this very same woman, along with the status and all this unexpected stuff, she gets to come in and throw that in her face. You know what I'm saying? It'd be one thing, because the thing is, Bertha and George have always been a united front. So no matter what's going on, it's like, okay, yeah, and whatever. So that would have even been one thing. But the fact that she didn't know, she was just like, oh, hmm, you didn't know? <gasps> yeah, that's George again. L, L, L. The L's keep coming. We see Watson finally meeting with his son-in-law, Mr. McNeil, and he gives him his backstory, which includes coming to New York as a banker, getting married, and then having his daughter, Flora. His father-in-law then forced his wife into divorcing Watson so that he would not have access to her inherited fortune. He then gave his wife a large settlement and retired in the meantime. But the panic of 57 completely blew apart his finances. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, the Panic of 1857 was a financial crisis in the United States caused by the declining international economy and overexpansion of the domestic economy. And since the world economy was more interconnected by the 1850s, it made the Panic of 1857 the first worldwide economic crisis. He was then forced to file bankruptcy, and as a result, he was no longer able to get another job in the banking industry. So with his knowledge of valets, he started from the bottom and worked his way up. But it appears that Mr. McNeil has a solution in mind already, which is for Watson to move to San Francisco with a generous pension that he will offer him. It also means that he will now be forbidden from seeing either his daughter or his future grandchildren for the rest of his life. It appears that Watson will at last be a man of means again. But is it worth the price he's ultimately paying? And here I was thinking that this was gonna be some kind of setup and Watson might end up getting beat up or something worse. And this is actually kind of worse. And then as someone who has been estranged from your child all these years and you're now in close proximity and there's still like the slightest chance that things could change, even though it seems impossible, for it to be this final like, no, you're done. You're never going to see her again. Yeah, I, I can't even begin to imagine. Although Bertha is still very much ill at ease with her husband, she does manage to set aside her feelings long enough to support him at his luncheon with Mr. Bill Henderson. We also see another luncheon occurring at the Van Ryn household, where Marion, Agnes, Ada, and Oscar have been joined by the Reverend Forte and Cousin Dashiell. Ada is delighted to discover that she and the Reverend share an appreciation for watercolors. She also references the artist Adolf Mensa. And the Reverend is also quite moved when he discovers that Ada has conspired with Mrs. Bauer, the cook, to create authentic New England clam chowder just for the luncheon. Although Ada and Reverend Forte might be enjoying themselves immensely, Agnes realizes that she's gonna need a whole, whole lot more wine. <laughs> as far as Mr. Henderson and George, 
Mr. Henderson expresses his concerns about the pay rate as well as working conditions. Unsurprisingly, George simply feels that things will evolve with time. But taking any action himself would simply affect the market. In the end, George suggests that if any of the men who work for him are displeased and unwilling to work, then they should simply step aside and make way for the many who are willing. He also offers Mr. Henderson a job in management, which would alleviate many of his current financial strength. But once again, Mr. Henderson can see right through George's ruse, and once again, he will not be bought. What's more, Mr. Henderson knows that the future is on their side, and with that, he departs. And if Mr. Henderson's meeting with the union labor force is any indication, their willingness to strike, to fight, and even to die for their cause, is about to lead George into a battle he may not be prepared for. Later, we see everyone gathered together to witness the premiere of the new play by the celebrated playwright, Oscar Wilde. However, it appears that said play is neither spectacular nor engaging. We also hear that Marion is planning to accompany Francis to a mother-daughter tea and she makes this suggestion after she learns about Frances being upset about, of course, her mother having passed and obviously not being able to be there for the tea. So Marion is ready and willing to be there for Frances, especially because she can relate having lost her mother as a young girl. Backstage, we see Aurora giving Mr. Wilde some intel on some of the guests, including Gladys Russell and Maud Beaton. He also seems to have an awareness of the close bond between Oscar and his friend John and the complication that may pose in the future. Now, Oscar Wilde, who was an Irish poet and playwright, was also very well known for his novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, and popular plays like An Ideal Husband, The Importance of Being Earnest, and Salome. But considering how his illustrious career was undermined in later years due to his criminal conviction for gross indecency for homosexual acts, Mr. Wilde's understanding of this relationship runs far deeper than Aurora can ever understand. Later, we see Ada having a run-in with Reverend Locke as he's dropping off contributions for the rummage sale. It's clear that the two have been having a fairly enjoyable rapport together and that only continues when he invites Ada to a gallery exhibition of Adolf Mensa's work on West 42nd, Saturday at 4 p.m. Ada also manages to rope her niece into an unexpected intrigue <laughs> when Marion volunteers to assist Ada by accompanying her to the gallery to, uh, of course, throw Agnes off the scent. After making her final plea to Mr. Fortune, <sighs> Peggy will have to be content with enjoying the train ticket that he has bought for her to accompany him into Skiki. As you can imagine, she is quite excited, but her mother is not, for reasons that are very, very apparent to me. Unfortunately, it seems that Peggy's rather privileged life in New York may have blinded her to some of the greater realities of the Black experience, not to mention its dangers. Her mother intently warns her that once she crosses the Mason-Dixon line, she is no longer human, and she must be distinctly careful regarding her gestures, looks, and even her general body language around white people. To Peggy, this is subservience. But to her mother, this is survival. I'm not going to expound too much on this because it really speaks for itself and so does history. But I will say myself, as someone who was raised up north in the Midwest and eventually came down to the South, hmm, I became aware of a lot of things that I was not aware of when I was up north. And... It was quite the eye-opening experience for me. And what was also eye-opening was reading slash listening to Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind 
when I tell you the veil was lifted as far as me understanding the Civil War, Reconstruction, and really getting into the minds of how these people thought and the rights that they thought they had in the aftermath of losing this war. I mean, in a way it wasn't surprising, but it still was just like, wow, you really, you really believe this. You really believe this. And let's, I just gotta be real about it. When it comes to racism, discrimination, prejudice, the South perfected that. They did. Jim Crow laws, the list goes on. The South really perfected racism and they ensured that any black person within the confines of those states, oh, absolutely not. Like, you operate in this box and that's it. Now, am I saying that there isn't all kinds of prejudice and racism, discrimination in all parts of this country and in all parts of the world? Yeah, no. So it's not limited to the South, but when it comes to the history of the South and how they went out of their way to perfect the laws and the regulations in place to keep black people in their place, changing the dynamics of their upward mobility, yes. And um, I'm just gonna leave it at that. Next, we see Bertha seeking intel on the Duke of Buckingham's lodgings when he arrives in New York in two weeks. And since he'll be arriving aboard the SS Servia, which is a Cunard ship, and George has Cunard contacts, he's in the perfect position to help her with this task. While Bertha is keeping a considerable distance still from George, if he succeeds in securing an introduction for her with the Duke, he may finally be on the road to forgiveness. Lastly, we see Ada finally meeting up with Reverend Forte at the gallery. When he asks Ada what her sister Agnes thought of her coming, she simply says that Agnes always has an opinion at the ready. Don't know if that was a good idea. She also mentions their appreciation for his appointment as rector. The Reverend is also grateful for um, several reasons. <laughs> And it appears that, much like the premise of this show, and despite Ada's many years of singleness, it seems that a new era is about to begin. And that closes out episode three, Head to Head. Of course, another solid episode. I am really enjoying the season. This whole situation with Mrs. Winterton slash Turner, that's gonna be a mess. <laughs> I, oof, I, yeah. <laughs> I just can't even begin to imagine the, the depths of that. So I think having Mrs. Winterton and Mrs. Astor as kind of the antagonist, you know, her antagonist at least, of the show, I think that creates a really interesting dynamic. And then of course, you know, her and George are not in a great place. So it's like, eh, I don't know. My girl Bertha might be down bad for the moment, but you know, she's always, she always knows how to make her way back up and I'm hoping she gets back there soon. Mr. Henderson and the Union Labor Force, I already know that's about to ramp up. George is not ready, I'm sorry. You can't throw money at everything. And what I was also going to say is that it's so ironic. Um, it might have been intentional or it just might have been a coincidence. But, you know, the strikes, you know, the writer strikes, the um, actor strikes that have been going on and, you know, what the conversation and just everything that happens surrounding that. It's crazy to think that, you know, all these years later, especially when it comes to these companies and these industries, you know, like we're talking like 1883. But this is like 2023, which is like 140 years after the fact. Yes, we've come a long way, but I'm just saying like the whole idea of industries and companies thinking that they can profit off of people's labor and that they don't have to pay and they, they can do all this, you know, sne you know sneaky, you know, snake-like stuff behind the scenes. Yeah, I hate to say it, but 
that has not changed, unfortunately. But as always, please feel free to drop down below in the comment section and let me know your thoughts on this recap and the episode in general. So once again, this is D Movie Man signing off and I'll see you with the movies. Thank you.